Hi, this is Scott Picard with Verde Real Estate Group with today's real estate tip. With us today is Brad Sheppy with, he's an attorney with Minnesota Landlord Law. How are you doing, Brad? I'm fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Well, Brad, really, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, today's topic is one that I'm really interested in, and it's contract for deed. And particularly yes. in, um, you know, in, in, in all contexts, but particularly in the context of a landlord, perhaps, or, you know, someone who's looking at buying an investment property. And you're going to kind of navigate us through some of the the nuances and the do's and don'ts of this. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So with that, uh, take it away. What, what, okay. do we, what do we need to know? Great. I'll, and feel free to chime in as well with your yeah. questions. So uh, contract for deed generally is distinct from a mortgage, which we, most of us, we talk to mortgage brokers or lenders and they get a mortgage on the property. And that is a lender giving you, the borrower, money to purchase the home. Well, the contract for deed is different. The, the contract for deed is essentially another term, quote, seller financing, right? right. So the, the, uh, the entity or person who owns the property is financing you, the buyer or purchaser, via a contract for deed to purchase the property. And so it, it, it varies state by state. So this conversation is very Minnesota specific. So if you have uh, rental properties or South Dakota or Wisconsin, um, check in separately on that. Um, but in the state of Minnesota, contract for deeds are permitted. They're, they're great. They're used often. They should not be frowned upon whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the advantages for contract for deed are you, you may be tied on the amount of money you have for a down payment. You may be a savvy investor who just wants to have less money down and just make more of your money work for you. Um, and you also likely avoid appraisal fees, origination fees by contract for deed. Essentially, it's just two parties agreeing contract for deed to um, how much money is the seller lending to you, the buyer, at what terms, and how long do you have to pay it back? Okay. Very general. And basically, that just depends on, like, you're the seller on the buyer. I say, hey, I want to buy zero down. Not necessarily that's what you'd want to take. Yeah. But we could agree on that. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, uh, you could, and, and, and then what? We determine a interest rate or monthly payment or yeah so usually the parties will work through what's you know just like you do any other deal letter of intent what is what is the purchase price um because effectively you still are buying it because anytime you have a contract for deed it it you also have a purchase agreement and so for example in minnesota there's a there's a contract for deed addendum to the realtor's purchase agreement form. Yep. And, and there's also an addendum to the contract for deed addendum. So it gets complicated. Um, and there are there are parties like myself, I'm an attorney, will even add custom language to that, call it uniform conveyancing blank. Mm -hmm. So, but specifically, you have the parties will agree on interest rate, money down, and there there's a lots of other terms that are just negotiated when the payment like the f balloon payment yes is due. it could be two years three years five years is there a maturity date is there a prepayment penalty um what day of the month are the payments made is there an underlying mortgage right because if there is um there's you know attorneys like myself could advise well there's risk there there's an underlying mortgage what happens if the, let's say i'm the buyer my client's the buyer you're the buyer yep um, if you're the buyer of the property, like Brad, I want to buy this property. And I need a really good contract for deed, but there's a mortgage. I would say, well, that's not the end of the world. Uh, there may be a, uh, an underlying mortgage that has a due on sale clause that may have a technicality, but you need to make a business decision if this is best for you. I can give my legal advice and you may come to the conclusion. I understand there's a mortgage, but we can work it out through the contract for deed. And I would say, great. Absolutely, you can, because as you get into the weeds on the contract for deed, you as a buyer can work through language with your attorney or someone who's done this before to say, if the seller doesn't pay the mortgage, I, the buyer, have the right to pay the monthly mortgage payments that then decrease the amount of principal on the contract for deed, I, the buyer. How might I know that, though? Like, say the seller is over here not paying... Uh, what can I demand to get the statements too? Or, yeah. I mean, because yeah. we would yeah. know. Yeah, right? good, good question. You may not know. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things. There's there's default language in in the contract for deed that would have the um, the buyer purchaser notified. Generally speaking, though, the seller no longer is in possession of the property, right? Right. Usually, if you're buying. Um, 
sometimes sometimes the buyer may purchase to occupy because they may have not a good credit score or otherwise right. your client may want to buy a home and that's the only way they can buy you may buy as an investor and your tenant may be there um, and so if there's and if there's something going on with a foreclosure by state law, they're notifying the property. So there's a, there's a notice coming to the house, right. putting on the door. So you likely would be notified um, if you have a tenant there or if you live at the property. So uh, kind of a different track here. Say I buy and my intention is to say it's a say it's a four unit and I'm going to move into it. And yep. I'm going to be an investor and occupant. And... But the unit I want to move into, the kitchen was, you know, came over with the Mayflower. So <laughs> I want to update yep. that kitchen. Yep. Um, does the, I mean, how do I make sure that I'm allowed to do that? That's a fantastic question. And so that's, that is a, that, that is a very good reason why you have an attorney who can use these conveyancing blanks. So you don't start with a fully customized contract, but you have a contract or uh, an attorney who adds language, who protects you, the buyer. So the key difference with contract for deed is buyers and sellers customize those that same contract to benefit you know him or her, and it happens all the time. So you need to be a, you need to be aware of that. But going to your to answer your specific question would be you need to build in language into that contract for deed that allows you the buyer purchaser to knock down walls that would otherwise be improvements or to modify plumbing that you have the written authority to do that without being inside a breach of contract. I want to say I could be Rambo and try to do it without approval. Then the, yeah. the seller could say you're yeah. in breach of contract and then cancel it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, and so for instance, let's say I, let's, let's just flip the script. Let's say um, you're the seller and you know that there's this swashbuckling, you know, bigger pockets, uh, oh, hacker, yeah who's uh, decided he's going to take this on while he has a girlfriend, two jobs, and goes to <laughs> Florida all the time, right? Right. And so, and I would be concerned about that person going in and renovating, knocking down walls, and all of a sudden running out of money, destroyed your property on the inside, and he's like, oh, peace out. I have only put 1% down. This doesn't work for me anymore. Here, you know, here are the keys. Yeah, it's a definite risk. Right? Yeah, you 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 now get your property back, even though you had an old kitchen. You get your property back with the interior that you can't just rent it out. You now have to put as a seller. You get the property back that may be of less value than you gave it under contract. You didn't give, but you contracted right. it to the buyer. So that's a good example that we were quickly able to assess that. And as a seller, you can put in language about. If you do X, Y, or Z, then you need, you know, written permission or other, that's a material breach of the contract and the seller can cancel the contract. So it's very case by case, but that's, that's the beauty at the same time of the contract for deed. Who has the insurance? Like say I'm the buyer, do you as the seller carry the insurance or do I? Well, again, either party can, but okay. it's both parties are named additional insured. So that's also negotiated. And if you go to the... Um, contract for deed addendum in the state of Minnesota, you can see that there's options to choose buyer or seller who holds insurance, who's making payments. So that actually gets, as an example, that comes up often because it's common for a contract for deed, someone to sell their property and contract for deed, but they have a mortgage right. and they have an escrow, right? So it's automatically paying insurance and taxes already. Yeah, because as a seller, I think I would want to be in charge of paying the property taxes and the insurance. Yeah. Because you don't want a, a buyer to move in or, you know. Yeah. Exactly. And then, and then quit paying the utilities, not pay the property taxes, yes. and let the, the insurance policy lapse and the thing burns down and I've got $20,000 <laughs> in property taxes, no coverage. And no kitchen. And no ki yeah, no kitchen. It's yeah. just a charred, you know, ruin. <laughs> and then I've got a, you know. Three thousand dollar water bill on top of yes, it too. Yes, yes, right? it runs and, on and the I property. Know, I mean, I'm not trying to fear monger. I've done contract for deeds. I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with the forms, I'm, and I'm, I'm raising these questions because they're questions I get yeah. a lot. And you know, I'm not trying to fear monger or, or, or scare people, but yeah. you know, there's a smart way to do it as a seller, and there's a smart way to do it as a buyer, Correct. right? You know, Correct. And, and yeah. a very, very reasonable ways to do it. Right. Yeah, and and if you do talk in a t to an attorney like myself. It's not this open-ended fishing expedition. It's right. really, generally speaking, it's kind of more surgical. Like, ah, hey, I'm the buyer. I'm the seller. 
you know, my client will tell me a little bit about the deal and we, you know, in a relatively short amount of time can advise language and add it to that addendum or modify it and um, they can be on their way and be protected. What if the buyer stops paying? What are, what are my options as the seller? Great. Good question. So that is also a benefit to the contract for Deed of Minnesota. They have what's called statutory cancellation which effectively is a 60 day cancellation. And so it's very specific. So if you're doing this on your own, um, I would say, good luck, you might be able to do it, but it's very specific in terms of how the notice works, uh, the timing of it. And you can get the property back in 60 days. And so let's say, let's go through your hypothetical. The buyer stops paying, they don't pay the month, um, let's say February, it was yep. due on the, the, uh, the, first. the third, the first or the third, they didn't pay. And your contract has, you don't have language about cure, right? So first of all, you, you'd go to your default language in your contract. You wouldn't just all of a sudden jump into the law. You would say like any business or contract, what does the contract say? Did I give away rights where the buyer has additional time to make a payment and cure? So let's assume for a moment they don't have the right to cure. They just missed the payment and I have the right to cancel. I would serve statutory cancellation. Um, that Again, Minnesota specific folks, if we're just kind of... Do you have to have the sheriff's deputy serve this? So, well, uh, no, you do okay. not. Um, but you, you generally it's kind of a process server type thing. Yeah, okay. um, but because you, you, you just want to... It's, it's helpful if you have a third party authenticate that it happened. Um, but so then under the statute, the buyer can still redeem prior to the 60 day expiration and the statute spells out specifically what additional amounts do they have to pay to step into the shoes of the buyer again and have the cancellation more or less terminated or right. uh, just go away. Um, so, so they have 60 days from the default date or yep. 60 days from service. Uh, service. Okay. Yep. Service. You have the default from when they know, and then. So if I served them on February, and I, and I don't want to get in the you know yep. too deep granular here, but I served on February fifteenth. They'd yep. have sixty days from that point. Correct. Okay. They'd so. have sixty days, and just real quick, um, the way it works is the the buyer can still, like I said, they would have to make all the payments due up to the day. So let's say it's March or April, the beginning of April. They still would have to make those payments. Plus the statutory amounts, I think it caps attorney's fees at five hundred. Okay. And so all those those fees, they would have to pay those specifically, and then they could redeem. Um, but if they don't, uh, if the buyer does not pay and they don't redeem, then you you can't just there's a in Minnesota there's called no self help, meaning you can't go to the door, knock onto the door, and say you're out of here, buddy. Uh, you can't do right. that. Um, if they're there, you'd probably try to go to the door and say, look, you didn't pay. I don't want to do this. I don't want to file an eviction on you. You have to leave. Um, and so what the next step would be is you'd still have um, possession. You'd have to address the possession issue. And you go through housing court and file an eviction. And what it's called is an eviction action post-cancellation of contract for deed. And then you'd have to go wait at least a, probably another entire month if, in fact, they're still there. If those people, the buyer, let's say it's a family, and it gets more complicated if there's tenants in the property. Right, so right. That's right. for another session. Yeah, no, no. This is this is great. I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on yeah. this. I mean, I, you know, I think we hit the high points and stuff. And um, if if somebody wants to learn more, because this is this has been great. I've learned something today. Great. Uh, and most people say that couldn't happen to me anymore. But uh, <laughs> but how do how do they get in touch with you, Brad? Fantastic question. Um, Best way to reach me is my cell phone, 612-770-7447. Again, it's Brad Sheppy with Minnesota Landlord Law. And my website at minnesotalandlordlaw.com, all spelled out. And they can click online and schedule a phone call uh, really easy. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. And I'm Scott Picard with Verde Real Estate Group. And we hope that this content has been valuable. Like always, if you want to get in touch with us, the number is 612 600 888-612-600-8888. Call or text or online 24-7 at verde-realestate.com. And if we could be of further service, please let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Brad.